my name is Jim Vieira. I'm a writer, researcher, a world explorer, and a historical detective. Uh, I'd like to share my research today on the lost world of giants. Uh, it, it's a strange and controversial subject, and you know, I've come to the point where ideas like this are accepted by some people, and you know, they 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 view it as intuitively making sense, and then there's others who will never get it, and you know, basically deride the idea. So. You know, I don't want to oversell my case. I just want to share what I find very interesting. The entire planet is littered with, with myth and legend about giants. It's woven into the landscape um, all throughout the British Isles, for instance, where virtually every ancient site is associated with the giant. A, a dolmen is a giant's grave or, or the giant's causeway uh, exists, you know, between Ireland and Scotland. And you just can't escape the idea that there's something to the story. So I find it particularly fascinating, and I just uh, you know ask the viewer to have an open-minded opinion about it and see what they think. <clears throat> as far as I'm concerned, I kind of fell into this whole strange um, topic by accident. I was just researching old documents in the towns of New England, uh, looking for stone structures that pre-existed the colonists, and started to find many strange giant accounts. And here, my brother and I are uh, in my office, The Daily Giant, uh, in Asheville, Massachusetts, uh, shooting a scene for a show we did for the History Channel. And, uh, you know, understandably, a lot of these shows are, are entertainment-driven, but we, we took it seriously as far as trying to verify all these strange accounts, talk to professionals, talk to skeptics and anthropologists, talk to Native peoples, and, and um, you know, just get a, an idea of what everybody's thinking about this and to hear the case that uh, archaeologists and anthropologists make against giants existing. So my co-author Hugh Newman and I compiled a, a book based on all these accounts, the legends of native tribes around the U.S. And, you know, what we put together, I think, is a pretty matter-of-fact um, tome about the possibility of giants existing. So, you know, one of the, the problems with modern-day anthropology is... Um, there's a pretty rigid paradigm that exists that doesn't allow for things like giants to occur to, you know, where do they come from? If humans evolved in Africa, spread out across the world and, and populate these different areas, and we evolved from Australopithecines in the lowest, lower homo genus, basically there's no room for giants. There's no room for a lost civilization where survivors show up that have different characteristics possibly like six fingers and six toes, <clears throat> or um, are unusually tall, like Cro-Magnon showing up in France and Spain 40,000 years ago <clears throat> with a fully formed culture and being exceptionally tall. You know, that, that just doesn't really exist in the world of anthropology. And evolutionary theory, frankly, is nothing more than educated guess. You know, a perceptual shift away from it within a different way of viewing it can, can change the whole paradigm. Uh, but right now, anthropology, you know, exists in this realm. You know, once you lay down a theory, then you have people who support it. Then you have people who, who become tenured by teaching these theories. And they're, they're just, you know, I'd say conspiracy doesn't take over. The human ego takes over. Agenda takes over. You're not in this field. I don't want to hear from you. Or if some, somebody threatens the status quo, they're just not well received. And that happens in all scientific disciplines. Um, you know, ideas like when the Alvarez uh, father and son team proposed that at Chicxulub in Mexico, a meteor hit 65 million years ago to wipe out the dinosaurs, that was considered heresy at the time, a ridiculous idea. And frankly, every fact of science was once damned, as Robert Anton Wilson uh, once said. So what you have here is, is a paradigm that's just an educated guess. And... Uh, I would say at this point, with all the new findings of Denisovans and human origins going back uh, deeper into antiquity, the, the idea and the story of human origins is all over the place. We just don't know, and scientists don't know. And we have out of Africa up, up in the air, the Clovis barrier seems to be obliterated. The idea that the only people that came to the Americas was uh, before, I mean, um, after 13,000 years ago from the land bridge. So I'm willing to look at these things from a mythological and esoteric viewpoint, and hopefully that you'll see the, the wisdom in that approach. <clears throat> and 
you know, I'm not going to go on a long rant about where humans came from, but there's a lot of evidence and a lot of belief that we're actually created uh, as a genetic experiment, if you will. Humans are very strange species. We, we seem to be completely different from some of, some of our supposed ancestors. And the rate at which we evolved and our brain capacity accelerated seems to be out of alignment. Like you'll have an elegant theory created like plate tectonics or, uh, you know, evolution out of Africa. And it's like, oh, that makes perfect sense. But then as time goes on, new science presents problems. And then these bridge theories are created to accommodate this new way of thinking. But they usually don't make any sense. It's just like, let's keep pushing this paradigm forward and patching it together in a Frankenstein manner rather than thinking, maybe we have it wrong. Maybe there's another mechanism we don't understand. And maybe humans were genetically created. It's in all the ancient documents, uh, the, the readings of mystics and the great chroniclers. And if you read Ella Silva's book, who's very level-headed, uh, and he gives a scientific evaluation of the evidence, um, and he makes a really strong case. So, you know, once again, just uh, the, the entire universe, all it does is produce life. It, it's just really um, um, crazy to think that we're the only ones here. And, um, you know, I'll just leave it at that, that what we think as incontrovertible uh, fact, like the science behind how your cell phone works, is much different than an educated guess that you have in geology and anthropology and archaeology. Now, you have to value everything and you get to demand certain evidence and scientific rigor, but at the same time, nobody has a time machine. You know, There's, nobody has uh, a monopoly on, on, on these kinds of truths, if you will. It's not an incontrovertible mathematical formula. So I think we should be open and look to the more, you know, esoteric, holistic sources uh, to figure out what's going on. So I'm going to start with um, one of my favorite sites on the planet, which is the, the walls of Sacsayhuaman down in Peru. Now, this is a megalithic masterpiece with stones up to 350 tons. And being a stonemason and somebody who is well-versed in engineering, uh, when I visit these sites, I'm, I'm awestruck, you know, I'm at a loss for words. When you look at these joints between the stones, they're not just um, so thin or so well fit, you can't get a razor blade between them. It's just like incomprehensibly um, met together at all seams all the way through here. And what you find at, at these ancient sites in Peru and, and uh, Bolivia and other places in South America is different levels of construction. Like here, you can see some of the after the fact, what I would say Inca building that goes, uh, comes after the Cyclopean ancient building that I believe is much more ancient than 200 AD. So when the Incas told the Spanish that they weren't the ones who built Sacsayhuaman, but the giants, that is what, you know, what is specifically noted uh, to be told to the Spanish explorers. They're like, who built these amazing structures? The Spanish were like awestruck. They thought devils and, and demons built the stonework. It was so outrageous. So in their mythology, there were huge people living in the Cusco area and carried huge blocks of stones and put them, them together. The Veracoches or the giants were the ones said to build some of these structures. And basically when you interact with native people, you realize there is a lineage of, a lineage of, of wisdom keepers who you know, continue to promulgate these ideas that were carried you know, for thousands and thousands of years about their past. So why would you slip in any erroneous information you know, as a culture with integrity who wants to tell the story of their past and their creation? So much like indigenous oral traditions all around the planet, here in South America, the uh, native people spoke of giants building some of these ancient structures. So the god Veracocha, this androgynous god who showed up and emerged from Lake Titicaca, he made earth and sky, then fashioned from stone a race of giants. Displeased with them, he turned stone, uh, some giants back into stone and destroyed the rest in a flood. Now, th there was like a mythological aspect here. And, you know, it, it's basically a mind that doesn't understand the supernatural or what these creator gods were doing uh, in the sense that, you know, th this sounds like a fairy tale, just like Jack and the Beanstalk. But this matches with, with uh, ideas about giants around the planet, that the giants were the first beings created and they, they were destroyed in some cataclysm eons ago. 
And this permeates through flood myths all around the planet, including in the Bible. So here is the god Viracocha right here. <clears throat> he's carrying, um, or he's representing this god self icon that Richard Cassaro, uh, researcher, talks about that you find all around the planet. And he's also often portrayed with uh, six fingers and six toes. So here are the, some of the megalithic uh, sites I'm just going to show you from my perspective. Uh, the, the pillowing or the scooping of, of this site at Saxiwaman in Peru, it looks like the stone was almost melted. In fact, the great explorer Percy Fawcett talked about this uh, as he searched for the lost city of Z. He, he uh, surveyed the Amazon. He's a well-known uh, explorer who disappeared with his son in the Amazon forest searching for the lost city of Z. So he talked about, so Fawcett talked about that birds would take this, this plant and they would put it in stone and they would melt these nests for their young. And he thought that this, these structures were built in a similar way, like the, the, the stone was softened somehow. So you'll find evidence of, of uh, amazing construction, engineering, and frankly, cataclysm all over South America at these ancient sites. One of the most telling is this flipped upside down staircase at the site of Saxiwaman. And you'll see right here, it's, it's cut into the stone and flipped upside down. It looks like a cataclysm through this all around. And, and that's what the ancient people said, that, that there was a great flood, a great cataclysm brought by the gods to destroy the giants. Now at Ole Te Tambo, we have these massive granite columns that are pieced together. And this is a particularly interesting site because it has these earthquake shims, if you will, uh, in the middle of them. And lo look at how meticulous and tight the seams are here. Just, just astonishing stonework. And I just, you know, I looked at every site and, and I looked at um, any clue that some of the lesser construction had been built before some of the megalithic masterpiece, and I could find none of it, whether I went to the top of Machu Picchu or every ancient site, which I essentially found was that it spoke, the stones basically told me a story that there was a more ancient building technique, a cyclopean building uh, that occurred in the distant past. And here is the side of, of the shot of Ole Te Tambo, and you see these are not thin stones. They were brought from a quarry over that mountain, a place I know uh, David Hatcher Childress and Brian Forrest have visited. I haven't been there yet, but it's, it's really uh, an incredible trek to get these over here. And you find these sites all around, um, you know, the, or the stonework all around these sites, I should say, with these, these odd protrusions that you find uh, in e uh, ancient Egypt and other places as well. <clears throat> so these fits don't just, um, they're not just tight on the surface. If you pull this block back, all the interlocking seams, this, this flawless and meticulous joining of, of seams goes all the way back into these interlocking fits which implies mathematics and engineering and expertise that, you know, uh, frankly, I think like geologists, archaeologists, folklorists, and, and a, a team of people should be viewing these, these uh, sites and trying to assess how they were built and if it was possible. And I would say with the tools of the time, these sites were not, you know, possibly built by the people that were attributed with the construction. Now, th there's a lot of ideas uh, that, that have basically um, embedded in, in racism, like, oh, oh, these, these, uh, these gods showed up and did all the stonework trying to, you know, pull away all these um, great accomplishments from Native people. That, that's not what I'm about at all. I think if you look into the story of the past, flood survivors and gods are known to show up everywhere uh, and, and restart civilization. And it, it's, it doesn't have anything to do with, with who could do what. It was more like, where did we come from? So I'm going to show you a few more sites here. Uh, I think you'll start to understand what I'm talking about. You know, you have these incredibly multi-angled cuts fit together in the city of Cusco. Here's Brian Forrester and I talking about the, this pillowing effect on these walls and the different layers of construction. And in fact, in the 50s, archaeologists, they, they fully took apart this wall. I think an earthquake revealed this. And here is an ankle wall in front of the oldest Cyclopean building. And here's what it looks like today. And you see the after the fact, this kind of lame, uh, maybe Inca, Spanish uh, building that, that occurred after. So remember that the native people who lived here for thousands of years said this was built 
by a, a lost race of giants, which is uh, <laughs> whatever you want to make of it, it's pretty wild. Here's the Cori Cancha, uh, the Temple of the Sun in, in Cusco, and it's uh, you know, a fascinating uh, megalithic site. Here's Machu Picchu, up at the top level, just, just an astonishing uh, amount of uh, expertise portrayed here. So when the first chronicle has arrived in, uh, with Pizarro, the Inca explained that Tiwanaku had been constructed by a race of giants called the Huaris before the period of darkness and was already in ruins before their own civilization began. And you have many of these ancient statues of, of bearded beings and uh, the sun gate with Veracocha. Here's Arthur Posnansky with some of these, you know, creator god statues. Who are these people? You know, were they giants? Were they uh, of a lost continent? Oop. Do, do. And then you get to Puma Punko, a site that people, you know, really interested in ancient mysteries are, are well aware of. And once again, I was there and astonished as a stonemason. I have a friend who owns a massive diamond saw and cuts Ashfield stone and makes countertops. And there's like a polished level that looks like a diamond saw and there's interior cuts. There's just this incredible um, precision in the cutting that you just can't do with it without some kind of machining or technology we don't understand. You just can't pull that off in a thousand years of chiseling away with carpet chisels or the tools of the time. I got a nice cat shirt right there. Uh, one of the accounts that came from here was from a Captain Beasley who found a giant skull in Bolivia of a human being who must have been eight feet in height. Now there's all kinds of mysteries uh, from the site. We have the Paraca skulls that Brian Forrester talks about. There were several elongated skulls found at Puma Punku, as a matter of fact, in the early 1900s. Now this idea of giants is all throughout Mexico and uh, all throughout South America. One of the Spanish, Spanish priests chronicled um, this um, oral tradition of killing a giant in the mountains uh, that the Toltecs told him. And this isn't codex in the, in the Vatican. And make of it what you want, but this is the idea, just like native people and people all around the world, that there was a cannibalistic race of giants that existed. And here are some of the accounts from Mexico. Charles Clapp, who recently returned from Mexico, has been in charge of Tom, uh, Thomas Lawson's mining interests. He has called the attention of Professor Agassiz to a remarkable discovery made by him. He found in Mexico a cave containing some 200 skeletons of men each above eight feet in height. The cave was evidently the burial place of a race of giants who antedated, antedated the Aztecs. So you have many of these accounts, 10 foot tall in Nayarit, Mexico. Uh, two, great me uh, two men said the discovery had made in great burial mounds in the mountains of Southwest here. And you just have these, these uh, explorers and archeologists reporting, you know, some outrageous things around the planet. Right here, Hugh and I are in a burial mound uh, site around 6,000 years old in France. And these are some of the megalithic sites that we visited. Uh, and we took a, a trip to France to look for the, uh, the bones of the giant of Castelnau. So here is the Grand Men here. It was once 70 foot tall. 350 tons, at least 600 and 7,500 years old. And look how tall it was when it was once in uh, standing. This is a recreation of it right here. So you have these giant structures everywhere and you have these legends of giants in the area of Brittany, just like so many other places. So here is famous Karnak, Mont Saint Michel. And this is the account we went to investigate and look for the bones. Um, Basically, in 1890, um, four different bones, uh, femoral midshaft and other parts were found, and the anthropologist Laplange uh, studied them. And there was a peer review at the time of, of this case. And here are the, the bones right here. And this story was brought to us by the researcher, Micah Ewer, who's a friend of mine and has done a lot of work in this area in uncovering the, these uh, buried, buried um, reports. Right here is another shot of it. And this is what these, these bones look like when compared and, you know, re-articulated into proper size. You have basically the remains of an 11-foot giant. 
And that's what the conclusion was of these scientists at the time. And they uh, indicated it wasn't uh, morbid growth, it wasn't pituitary gigantism. So Lepange, well-regarded anthropologist respected by Madison Grant and even included in Toppenard's journals. So his atheistic, Darwinian, socialist, anti-Semitic, eugenist views make his discovery of giant bones all the more noteworthy. This is what Micah Hughes was saying about this find. His calculations indicate the Neolithic giant man was about 3.5 meters tall and several hundred kilograms weight, 11 feet six and a thousand pounds. So we went and we searched for these bones at the University of Montpelier, but Lepange was fired because he was such an anti-Semitic and a racist. So we were looking and trying to find if they were in a private collection or not because we wanted to get them examined and DNA tested, but so far um, we, we haven't found what happened to them. So that story doesn't stand alone. Right here you have skulls measuring 28, 31, and 32 inches of circumference, which is absolutely enormous. And they were supposed to have been brought to the Paris Academy. Once again, the, these ancient reports or these ancient remains are brought to uh, different institutions and then they can't seem to be located. Um, we have many of these accounts from France, bones of giants around earth near Paris. This is after the war that German prisoners found many of these giant remains. This skeleton, one of which measured eight feet, seven inches, lay in a sarcophagus formed of flat stones in Gap, France. <clears throat> this one is particularly interesting. In each case, the heads were of great size with huge jaw bones. In the U.S., you have many of these accounts where the jawbone fits over the face. Right here, a 13-foot-long skeleton uncovered. And basically, Cecilia Hall, our friend, put together this map in the U.S. showing all these accounts. Once again, I'm not going to claim every one is true, but there's another story going on here. Is it, you know, can it be that all these were conjured up as hoaxes or, or mismeasurements? It really seems unlikely. And... Hugh and I right now are writing a book on the giants of the British Isles and all these accounts are starting to come forward as well. And this is uh, a phenomenon that, that you find in isolated Pacific islands. It's basically all ubiquitous all around the world. So at the site of Nan Medal in Pohnpei, you have the megalithic ruins that exist there. And the native people there tell the story that there were two twin brothers who were sorcerers who showed up from a lost, sunken continent, and they levitated these stones to build this ancient site. Now, it's dated to around 12 or 1300 years ago by the Sardalair Empire, by modern-day archaeologists, but the natives tell a different story. And in fact, my friend uh, who was on my show, Al Parapan, he lived in Pohnpei, and he taught uh, English there, and he was friends with many of the natives. In fact, he, one day he took fruit from the site when he visited. He brought it back and they told him to throw it away because it was cursed. The native people literally call this place the place of ghosts, the place of giants. They view it in a malevolent way. They, they don't take credit for their ancestors having built it. <clears throat> There's basically the uh, superstitious dread associated with the site. And, and that's not like uh, conjured up so somebody could you know, write a passage in a book or something like that. That's literally what the native people say there. So you also have this account from the American Geographical Society. Uh, in 1838, Captain Coffin of the ship Ohio Nantucket and Captain Sherman of the Marcus Fairhaven visited the vaults together in Nanmadal non and took from it human bones of gigantic size. Now that's the American Geographical Society. It's not the National Enquirer. You know, there are many reputable publications that are reporting these giant finds. Here's the site right here. It's a massive megalithic complex. I think a, over 250 million tons of basalt was quarried and brought from the other side of the island to build this place. It's really, you know, quite an amazing construction. And here's this story we covered in our show as well. In the early 20th century, when the island was under German rule, Governor Victor Berg entered the sealed tomb of Nan Medal and opened the coffin of the ancient island rulers. He found skeletons of giants eight to nine feet tall. The next morning on April 30th, 1907, on a stormy night, Governor Berg died. <clears throat> the German physician serving on the island could not determine the cause of death. The natives, certain it was a curse that proved supernatural powers uh, guard the city of the dead. 
So you, you find this like soars of thunder uh, idea all around the planet where you disturb the ancient graves uh, of the giants. You, you end up um, conjuring some, some kind of geomantic or, or uh, you know, supernatural dread and, and storms and things like that. So Hugh and I must think that's funny. Uh, here we are at our office. <laughs> And uh, I have like the Zodiac Killer, all these accounts pasted all over the wall. Now, this is another uh, part of the world where giants were reported in Patagonia. And, you know, we had these reports for hundreds of years from Magellan and uh, Sir Francis Drake. And there were reports of nine and ten foot tall giant people. You know, I think the reality might be a little uh, in the middle, if you will. <clears throat> Maybe not nine and ten foot tall, but certainly you know, uh, a race of people that seem uh, much taller than, than your average day people, an anthropological curveball, if you will. So we have Frederick Cook, who wrote about the Ona tribe from six to seven and a half feet tall, and they wore animal skins, had horse endurance and bull strength. He photographed a six foot six Ona woman, a seven foot male, and others. So in researching um, the British Isles, for these accounts of giants, we, we found an association uh, at basically all every megalithic site you can uh, mention. There's a, a giant account or a giant legend. And here we have Merlin uh, being assisted by a giant in the creation of Stonehenge called the Giant's Dance originally. And we have this nine foot four inch skeleton that was found uh, in near Salisbury in the area of Stonehenge. And this account is, is particularly telling because a lot of the criticism is like, oh, these, these accounts are hundreds of years old. They're, they're farmers and, and you know, folklorists and people who don't understand science. But this account was made in 1950. Irish men were giant. Ancient supermen dug up in burial chambers. Now, this is at Four Knox in, in Ireland, this site. I Irish archeologists have unearthed traces of a bygone race of supermen in a prehistoric burial chamber dated to 2000 BC. They found human skeletons which tower head and shoulders over modern man. Most are around seven feet in height of extraordinary width of shoulder and massive bone construction and the yellow pages of Irish folklore and mythology. Seven foot giants strode gloriously through a land of milk and honey. So here's the site right now, Four Knox, and this is what it looks like. <clears throat> and this is hardly the only site that we you know, find giant's remains reported. Right here, I found the skeleton of a man measuring eight feet. Uh, eight foot, five and a half, unearthed with an old sword bearing the following inscription, Donoc O'Keefe, 1231 AD. Uh, 10 foot tall uh, giant reported here. The, per, the three persons had been interred in separate graves, all encased in stones. The skull of the giant measured 18 inches from the crown to the head of the head to the chin. Uh, once again, uh, the, me uh, the measurement of a stationary object is occurring here. So it's like 18 inches, head to crown, head to chin. Femur bone was 29 inches. Circumference was 32 inches, you know, things like that. Uh, this is an interesting account. This, this giant has six toes. It was published in, in an article, I think in 1897 in the Strand Magazine. Now, people scoff at this because the Cardiff giant in the United States was found and uh, it was known to be a hoax that was created. And the whole idea was derided of, of uh, it, it being real. But this was laid up against a, a rail car here for this picture. And they, they basically showed this giant all around, you know, the UK and Ireland in the late 1890s and then it disappeared. And it has six toes, which is interesting. And I can't really proclaim to know what the story is all about. I just wanted to show it. And here is the, the entire story uh, of it right now, 12 feet, two inches. So all around the British Isles, you have dolmens that are considered giant's graves. They're really beautiful works of construction. They're always associated with, with giants and, and dropping stones from their aprons or uh, you know, ancient pathways. And uh, being a, a stonemason, I'm just a fan of, of the beauty of all these constructions and how challenging it is to build these things. And speaking of a challenging site, uh, here is Baalbek in Lebanon and these three uh, stones 
weigh from 800 to 1,000 tons, I believe. Uh, for me, this is a real megalithic marvel. The, the, the weight, I think, is around 2 million uh, pounds for these stones that were laid up at Baalbek. And there's some speculation that, you know, it's more ancient than Roman times. And, you know, the local people tell a different story. And here's an account from 1432. Baalbek is a good town, well enclosed with walls and tolerably commercial. And the center is a castle built with very large stones. At present, it contains a mosque in which it is said there is a human skull with eyes so enormous that a man may pass his head through their openings. His hue at uh, the quarry shows you how outrageous and, and uh, immovable these stones are. So Graham Hancock says the, the following, I believe these huge megaliths long predate the construction of the Temple of Jupiter and are likely to be 12,000 more years old, compar uh, comp contemporaneous with the megalithic site of Gobekli Tepe in Turkey. I suggest we are looking at the handiwork of the survivors of a lost civilization, that the Romans built their Temple of Jupiter on a pre-existing megalithic foundation and that they were unaware of the giant hewn megaliths in the ancient quarry as these were co uh, covered by sediment in Roman times. <clears throat> now here's the Roman construction at the site. According to the Maronite Patriarch of Lebanon, tradition states that the fortress of Baalbek in the most ancient, is the most ancient building in the world. Cain, the son of Adam, built it in the year 133 of the creation during a fit of raving madness. He gave it the name of his son Enoch, in the name of his son Enoch, and peopled it with giants who were punished for their inequities by the flood. So here in Egypt, once again, we have legends of giants. This is put together with, uh, by researcher Muhammad Abdo. Uh, you see these giants portrayed all through Egypt. And in fact, we have an account um, in 1881 of Professor Timmerman, uh, Timmerman finding giants in the Temple of Isis. Here is Zawi Hawass uh, looking at what is uh, categorized as a giant with elongated skull. Uh, Love to know what he's thinking. And the, the site of the Assyrian and other sites in Egypt are thought to maybe be more ancient than once believed. I could tell you that the megalithic construction here of granite is, is ex, uh, exceedingly impressive. And you find these um, myths and legends that surround these sites as well. So we are told in the year 820 AD, Way back in the days of the glory of Baghdad, the great, great Sultan, the fall of the descendants of the great El Rashid of Arabian Nights, the Sultan El Rashid Al Ma'an, decided to open the Great Pyramid. <clears throat> he had been told that it had been built by giants who were called the Shedai, superhuman beings, and that within the pyramid and those pyramids, they had stored a great treasure beyond the knowledge of man. This is by Manley P. Hall, the uh, great um, Freemason author and wisdom keeper. And he relates this account of, of, of giants and the supernatural. That's one of the things here. It's, you know, in all these stories, you get supernatural aspects involved that, you know, in modern day, you're like, that's mythological. It doesn't make any sense. But that's what these people uh, talk about. These ancient people tell stories of the supernatural over and over again. In Sardinia, um, there are amazing megalithic structures accounts of giants, legends of giants. If you're a fan of ancient aliens, they just did an ancient Sardinian giant episode that Hugh Newman was in, and they used some of our research in the show and a lot of Hugh's footage. Uh, it's because it's a really compelling story. We have giant's tombs all around the island, and we have giant skeleton accounts. Like in 1953, Reuters reported that excavations at a nearby Porto uh, Torres have uncovered the skeletons of two giant warriors who died 4,000 years ago. The two skeletons, both intact and surrounded by weapons, furnishings, and vases, were more than eight feet tall. That's in 1953 by Reuters. Here are some of the tombs and the megalithic sites around the island. Just really, really fine stonework. It, it was considered the last stronghold of the giants, Sardinia was. And just like Malta and other Mediterranean places, there are legends of giants associated with it. Here's some of the megalithic construction. Um, it, it seems like you can't separate giants from myth, legend, and megalithic building as well. 
So this is from 1911. Sardinia is celebrated for the tombs which prove that prehistorically it was inhabited by great giants. Recently, four new tombs have been found which contain skeletons over nine feet long. And then you have these statues uh, of, of giants, uh, the really weird uh, beings that are portrayed here. And this is one of my favorite accounts from Sicily. Uh, a Captain Allen um, is described in the Tongue of Time by Joseph uh, Comstock. So he found 170 feet down uh, this, this tomb. Uh, they, they were mining sulfur, I think. And in the spring of 1807, from the, some miles from the port of uh, Gergenti in Sicily, the bones were placed in a proper position. The skeleton was measured by Captain Allen at 11 feet, 4 inches Italian, which is 10 6 English. The skull, which is uh, with its jaws, were about the dimensions of a two-gallon bucket. The body and other giants were found in the stone sarcophagi, 170 feet below a sulfur mine. The, the people living there were, were sulfur miners, and they had dug 170 feet down, and they found this enormous skeleton in a tomb in this, uh, this marble tablet, uh, tablet with uh, strange hieroglyphs on it. So, in fact, when Captain Allen got back to Philadelphia, he wrote and noti got notarized um, a statement attesting to his, his report. So, Captain Allen wrote a sworn statement attesting to the truth of his find. And Joseph Backus uh, has this letter in his book, and Captain Allen lays out the entire story where he talks about this absolutely enormous skeleton that was found. And it speaks of, you know, giants of a lost age. Um, you know, it is worthy of notice that the Cyclops, a race of men of gigantic stature, were referred by the ancients to the very region these bones were found, the western parts of Sicily. So all around Sicily, you find these megalithic cyclopean buildings that you find in other parts of the world, once again associated with the lost race and associated with giants. Uh, once, you know, the, this, this interfitting, interlocking, super ancient stonework is found in many parts of Italy and Greece. And here are some of the walls here, quite astonishing. So you go over to Malta and Maltese folklore describes giants as having built the temples which led to the name Gigantia meaning giant's tower. Here's Malta right here. All throughout Malta, you have myths and legends of giants. You have super ancient megalithic buildings and temples. Really an astonishing uh, array of megalithic sites. And in the Bible, you have this account of the giant of Gath who has six fingers and six toes, 24 digits in all. At the hypogeum in Malta, uh, about 100 years ago, it was reported there was a handprint with six uh, fingers on the wall. I contacted the curator of the museum. He said, in fact, yes, we know there was uh, uh, one reported by like a noted archaeologist, but we've been unable to find it. So somewhere in this temple, there is a handprint with six fingers. So congenital formations, a historical perspective from the Medical Journal of Malta. Uh, Polydactyl, six fingers and six toes, is also evident in a handprint described from the hypogeum, as well as Hagar Kim. You have, uh, his, you have polydactyl and a statuette from that site as well. So the, those, the large women, uh, the, the Neolithic um, goddesses are, are the statues that they're talking about. And the one from the temple had um, polydactylism represented which you find all around the world, this idea of six fingers and six toes associated with giants. So here we have uh, the Canary Islands, another place with myths and legends of giants. It's a really beautiful area. In this account, you have a gigantic race of men being reported. And one of these stated to have been found as quoted in Pritchard 1855, which measured 15 feet in length. The skull contained 80 teeth which is uh, quite, quite an extraordinary find. So Professor Chris Coombs in The Giants of Wales writes this account as well. In the time of Hadrian the Emperor, there was raised from the earth a giant called Ida. This is around 200 AD, who, had 20, uh, who was 20 feet in length and who had double sets of teeth or two rows of teeth standing completely preserved in his head or gums. And you find this all around ancient America. Here's Noble County, eight foot skeletons with double rows of teeth. And I find this particularly interesting. Um, Alice Cook Carter writes, the chaplains of Bethancourt found in Fuerteventura 
men of extraordinary stature. This is on the Canary Islands. They were by some supposed to be a race of giants. Among the dead after a certain battle, the Spaniards found a warrior nine feet in length. All the Canary Islands remains of buildings have been found. In all cases, they were of a cyclopean class of architecture made of blocks massed together without the use of cement, often cut and polished and fitted with such skill that the interior appeared as if whitened with gypsum. The stones were sometimes so large that it seemed impossible that men could have placed them one on top of the other. Now, I have not located in the Canary Islands these sites that are talked about in this report yet. We do know there are pyramids in the Canary Islands that Thor Heyerdahl investigated. There were different thoughts about when these were built, but it seems like there's a megalithic mystery uh, tied to this idea of giants in the Canaries. <clears throat> so six fingers and six toes is, is something that is found uh, in isolated Pacific Islands as well as the American Southwest and other places. And here is the island of Kiribati. <clears throat> so in 1949, I.G. Turbot, the anthropologist, uh, wrote a book about the uh, footprints there. So this is what he said. The short account is a factual report without any personal comments or interpretations of the position of two series of footprints appearing on Tara Atoll in the Gilbert Islands, as shown to me and explained by some of the old men of Tarawa. The location of the present capital of the Gilbert and Elise Islands colony. Here is one of the giant footprints. It's a kind of washed out picture uh, with six, fing uh, six toes. Here there is a, one of the elders uh, standing in it as well. And the, uh, the elders of the island said that giants lived there and, and giants existed uh, in the past before a, a great flood. In Easter Island, you have the same thing. You have six fingers, six toes found. In Fiji, you find handprints uh, with six fingers. In Australia, you have the guardian spirits with six fingers and six toes, these giant beings uh, who are basically portrayed with, with this polydactylism that is reported in the Bible in the specific account associated with giants. You find it all around the Americas. In fact, you find it all around the globe in ancient statues or, or um, these ancestor worship idols. Some of the oldest statues on the planet show six fingers or six toes. And it's pointing to this, this idea of, of this parent race or this lost race. And, you know, it, to me, as somebody just tries to piece all the, the, the parts together, it, it's, it seems beyond coincidence that you have so much of the same strange and specific notations uh, by people had in, in civilizations that had no contact with each other. So, you know, like I said, uh, I, I really, uh, I think there's a story here and, you know, it rings true to me. Intuitively, it makes sense. And I'll leave it up to the, the viewer to decide. But, you know, as science progresses and hopefully becomes more open minded and more sites are unearthed, maybe we will get more and more evidence that supports a more mythological uh, past. So I appreciate you listening and uh, thank you.